my pleasure to introduce Tim and Tafel. Uh, he will talk about the PID, PID module form, energy continuation application. Thank you for the introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So, so I've been asked to talk about the main geometric method in the paper of Buzzard and Taylor, uh, which is called Companion Forms and Weight One Forms. Um, so this is a paper in which they use the geometry of modular curves to prove a certain modularity lifting result, which then uh, later they used uh, with uh, Shepard, Barron, and Dickinson to prove many cases of the Artin conjecture over Q, which was open at the time. So I think, uh, first of all, it's a very beautiful application of geometry to number theory. So for that alone, it fits very well in the framework of uh, this workshop. But more so because until very recently in the past few years, it has inspired several papers by various authors um, where the idea of analytic continuation introduced by them was used to prove a classicality results and modularity results or various Shimura varieties. So if you are interested to learn about those, this would be a, a good place to begin. All right, so my plan for the, uh, the two talks would be as follows. Today, it will be basic. Uh, essentially, I want to talk about the piadic geometry of modular curves and use that to define uh, piadic modular forms over conversion modular forms and the action of Heike operators on them and do um, basically set up uh, the construction for, for the application of analytic continuation, okay? The second talk, I, I will mainly focus on the analytic continuation. And, um, well, I, I will go through the main steps of uh, the geometric part of the proof. And if time allows, I would, I would say a few things about the higher dimensional case. Maybe I'll use the mod Hilbert modular surface as an, as an example. Okay, so we'll, we'll see if I will have time to do that. All right, so piadic modular forms. The, the basic usefulness of piadic modular forms comes from the fact that it gives you an enlargement of the space of classical forms in which you can do piadic analysis. And therefore, you can take advantage of the idea of piadic variation. So that is like the basic thing to begin with. And if you want to have that, uh, if you want to achieve that, then there are many ways to define piadic modular forms depending on the application you have in mind. The one that I want to explain to you is the geometric approach because for the work of Buzzard and Taylor, it is crucial to realize them using geometry. Okay, so uh, these piadic modular forms will be defined as certain function and the moduli of elliptic curves and uh, extra data. So that would be the approach. Uh, in fact, for classical modular forms, we all know such, um, such a description. So let me recall that, and then I'll go from there to uh, piadic modular forms. All right, so classically, modular forms are uh, holomorphic functions on the upper half plane. Um, and then you have a, uh, a congruent subgroup. And you have a certain invariance property of this function under the action of gamma on H. So immediately, that uh, descends the problem onto the quotient. And the fact that in the definition of modular forms, we have these growth conditions at infinity, it, it, it transforms into, it translates into the fact that this object extends to uh, to, the, to, a, to a finite number of points, cusps. Well, we know that this H mod gamma is, a, is an open Riemann surface, and these cusps compactify it. And what we get almost immediately from the definition is a section of a holomorphic, the global section of a holomorphic sheaf on this compact Riemann surface. Okay. Now, as it was explained uh, today, earlier, uh, this compact Riemann surface is algebraic, it's algebraic variety. It's 
projective. Uh, and then if I invoke Serre's Gaga, that implies that uh, modular forms, which are initially uh, holomorphic sections here, are algebraic sections uh, or are, are global sections of algebraic sheets. And these modular curves, so these are called modular curves. Okay, so this is the way you pass from uh, complex analysis to algebraic geometry, and Skyven explained the, the importance of that is now we can talk about uh, you know, other rings, rings other than uh, the complex numbers, yeah, number fields, etc. All right, now what we want to do is to pass further from the world of the realm of algebraic geometry to periodic analytic geometry. Okay, so I will explain that to you. So, So let me be more precise and set some notation. So modular curves, let me assume that n is an integer at least four, p is a prime. I'm going to assume that p does not divide n. And maybe for the notation that I will be using, I need to assume that p is uh, bigger than three, but it doesn't matter. The congruent subgroups that I will consider, there will be two types, either gamma 1n or gamma 1n intersection gamma naught b. Those are the two types that I will consider. And for, for those, I'm going to have a, an algebraic variety, or actually a scheme, m sub gamma, defined over z1 over n, well, proper, such that when you extend the scalars from that to the complex numbers in gamma sub c, what you get is that compact Riemann surface over there. as Riemann surfaces. In fact, if you look at the away from the cusp, so the non-cuspidal part, of M gamma uh, is the moduli space. of pairs E gamma, where E is an elliptic curve defined over uh, a ring, which is a Z, Z1 1 over N algebra, and a level gamma structure. Level gamma. What is that? If gamma is gamma 1n, then gamma is the data of a point of exact order n. On E, and if gamma is gamma 1n intersection gamma naught p, then gamma is, well, such a p. In addition, we want to include a subgroup, which is finite flat, order p inside p. So these modular curves are moduli spaces of elliptic curves with level structure. And in fact, the way you prove this is uh, using that fact, showing that 
this also uh, classifies such data over the complex numbers. Okay, what else? The other thing I need is a sheaf on M gamma, uh, which whose sections are going to give us modular forms. So there is a sheaf omega, and all I would say is uh, the following: that if you have an open inside N gamma, which corresponds to a family of elliptic curves with extra data, a section of omega on that would be a family of uh, invariant differentials on those uh, elliptic curves. Okay, so that's the sheaf of invariant differentials. And uh, so definition, this is the geometric definition of modular forms. If R is a Z1 over N algebra, then, um, sorry, M sub K, well, K is an integer. modular forms of weight k and level gamma with coefficients in R are defined to be the sections of this omega k, the k-fold tensor product of omega, and the base change of n gamma from z z1 over n to R. So that's our definition that we're familiar with. And I want to give a definition like that for periodic modular forms. All right. Now, one uh, bit of a bit of notation here. Whenever I have an element here, f, I'm gonna write, and if you have, you know, something like e and gamma on the modular curve, I'm gonna write f of e gamma as the uh, fiber of that section at this point. And this is going to be a section, a, a k-fold uh, invariant differential on E. So this I will use. And also another convention for simplicity, if gamma, if you are in the first case, uh, I write x for n gamma. And in the second case, I write why? Okay, for example, now because uh, I'm looking at Z1 over N algebra, I can, of course, consider the complex numbers and define uh, modular forms the usual way, or I can consider R to be the periodic numbers to P as well, because that's uh, a Z1 over N algebra. So let me focus on that. Let me call that m k gamma 1n without any coefficients. So that's going to be my shorthand notation, dropping the qp. And if I have a modular form there, um, then I can take f and evaluate it at, the, at a, a cusp at infinity. So, it, so f, so all the cusps are of the form, the multiplicative group divided by q to the z, and then there are various level structures in them, and I'm gonna choose the one that's given by the image of the uh, primitive n roots of unity inside here. That's an element of uh, a point of order m. And that's, I'm going to call f of q. And this is the q expansion of f at infinity. OK, so we have, we've got the, uh, almost everything, the classical theory. Let me see. The last bit is the Hecke operators. And, well, we, 
as you know, HECA operators are given in terms of HECA correspondences on the, on the modular curve. So let me give you what those are. I'll just give you some examples. For example, if L is a prime does not dividing N, which, which does not divide N, then T, TL applied to AP is formally take this data and, and quotient out by all subgroups of order L. Also, if you are at a prime that divides the level, for example, on y, where the level is p times n, if you take L to be p, then you call the operator up, and up of this point is going to be a sum of, again, the quotient by all subgroups, uh, p bar h bar plus c inside e subgroup of order P, but for UP we have to exclude uh, subgroup H. So C is different from H. So, so we all know that. I have set up the classical theory for you geometrically now. And um, now I want to move towards the, the piatic setting. Now first let me talk about the mod P picture. And, and then from there, we can, we can go on. Right, so the mod p geometry and mod p modular forms. OK. So notation, of course, fp is uh, Z1, uh, 1 over n algebra. So I could consider <coughs> the base change of x and y to fp, or you could think of it as the piadic uh, reduction of x and y. I'm going to call them x, fp, and y, fp. OK, how do they look like? Well, first of all, because I'm just base, doing a base change, these are, again, modular problem for the same kind of data over rings that are FP algebras. Okay. But we can say more about, well, we can say a lot about the geometry. X FP is going to be a smooth Curve and YFP is going to have two, it's going to be a regular scheme, but it's going to have two two uh, irreducible components, each of which is isomorphic to XFP, and they intersect transversely at exactly the super singular point. So these are the super singular points. Of course, there's a map which forgets the subgroup. And this map is one to one on one of the components and P to one on the other one. And by the way, if you want to know, the components are, so there are three strata here, the super singular ones. And the ordinary part has two uh, components, this one and the other one. And one of them is the moduli of, um, uh, triples like this, where h is mu p and one is h is z over p z, at least you know, over for geometric points. So that's the piadic, the, the mod p geometry. And of course, I can define a mod p modular form as a section of omega and the mod p reduction. So definition. Um, I guess call them MK of gamma 1 FP, which I've already defined, is 
the global sections of X, S, T, and M. So this is, our, this is the space of mod P modular forms for me. level gamma 1 n. Okay, let me give you an example of uh, a mod p modular form. So the famous example of the Hesse invariant. So the Hesse invariant is a mod p modular form of weight p minus 1 defined as follows. All right, I'm not going to, uh, well, define it properly. I'm just going to give you the fiber at every point here. But of course, you can globalize this definition. What's the fiber of this Hesse invariant? Did I give it a name? Call it H. At a point um, E and P. Now, this is now in characteristic P, elliptic curve over an FP algebra. Okay, so I, I have to give you something. I have to give you a P minus one fold uh, differential in this. So. Let's pick some non-zero di invariant differential. And then consider the Verschiebung map which goes from E uh, twisted by P to E. So the differentials here are generated by omega, and the differentials here are generated by the twist of omega, omega alpha P. So if I pull back omega, I'm going to get a, a multiple of omega p. And to define again over there, the assay invariant of E and P to be uh, lambda times uh, omega to the p minus one. Of course, we'll have to check that this is independent of the choice of the omega, and that's uh, easy to see. But, of course, what's interesting about the Hasse invariant is that it, it uh, tells you about the supersingular points on the modular curve. Yeah? So, H of EP is zero if and only if uh, V upper star is zero, if and only if V is super singular. All right, so this is your XFP. There's a section of a line bundle on it. The zeros are exactly the super singular points. And I want to tell you uh, three facts about that, which I will use. First of all, the Hasse invariant gives a parameter at every super singular point, meaning that it, it vanishes to order one at, at uh, every super singular point. The other one is that the Q expansion at infinity of the Hasse invariant is a constant one. And finally, if you look at the Eisenstein series of weight p minus 1, and you look at the q, q expansion coefficient reduced in mod p, you'll get 1. So it tells you that the reduction of that mod p is the Hasse invariant. OK. Now I can talk about periodic modular forms. Periodic modular forms. Right. How, do we, how do we define them? Of course, 
certainly one way not to define them is to just base, just, uh, base extend everything to periodic numbers. Yeah. That would be like taking the space of modular forms of a fixed weight and periodically completing it, which doesn't change the dimension. So in fact, the correct way to do it would be to do the same, but consider, uh, let the weight to vary. Okay. Consider limits of Q expansions of modular forms of, of varying weight. And that's how Serre defined them. But uh, as I said, you want to give a, a geometric definition, which was given by Katz. Okay. So Katz wanted to give a definition of these in the same spirit, meaning that there are functions on this moduli of elliptic curves and level structure. And he was interested in them in the context of studying congruences between modular forms and wanted to have a theory that uh, uh, reflected the congruences between, periodic congruences between the Q expansions of modular forms. In the sense that if you had two modular forms F and G of different weights, which were congruent modulo a power of P, so this is just the Q expansion relation, then you wanted to show that their difference divided by P to the R is in fact the Q expansion of a periodic modular form. So think about that. We have a very famous congruence that I've written over there, which tells you that EP minus one is congruent to one mod P and if you, were, if you were to have such a theory, um, what would happen? If, if, you, if you applied this congruence, well, first of all, it would tell you that EP minus 1 minus 1 is a multiple of P, where F is some periodic modular form. And if you applied it as some elliptic curve with level structure, um, and reduced it mod P, so that would be the Hasse invariant, and then E and P will become the reduction of E and P. And uh, which, uh, of course, this is not correct if E is super, uh, if E bar is super singular. Okay. So if you wanted to have such a description of periodic modular forms, you would have to remove. Um, all EP from your modular space such that the reduction was super singular. Okay. So let me think, uh, let me look at this reduction map a little bit more systematically. What is the reduction map? It's a map from this modular space to the other one. Uh, I know, in fact, let me put uh, this lines here to indicate I'm just talking about points. So points here, uh, uh, close points on both sides, okay? That's what I mean. And how is it defined? If you have a point R, there are two possibilities. Either it is, has good reduction, so it's some E P, and so it has an integral model, so you can reduce it and get E, par, e bar, P bar, or Otherwise, you just send it to the cusp and the corresponding level structure. So that's, that's your reduction map. And what I'm saying is that if you wanted to have a, a geometric theory, you'd have to consider the following set of points, which is take XQP, points of that and remove from that everything that reduces to the super singular points. Okay. But of course, um, this is not an algebraic variety. Um, so, uh, well, if you want to make sense of the same definition, you, you, want a, you want periodic analytic variety, which this is. 
Okay, so let me explain how this is a periodic in fact. This is uh, the set of points of a periodic rigid analytic variety. Now, I, I would like to take a few, uh, a few minutes and give a very brief and incomplete introduction to, to rigid geometry if, you know, if there are people who haven't worked with it. Okay? So it will be very incomplete, but at least it will tell me, uh, give me some of the things that I need to use uh, to continue. So I guess. Rigid analytic varieties. Okay, how are, what do I want from it? At least in my talk, this is the, this is the thing I need. I need if I start with an uh, with an algebraic variety, or let's say over QP. Okay, so I have an algebraic variety over QP. I want to have a periodic analytic version of that, so that I can you know I can play those games with. So let me call it M analytic. And this is supposedly in some category of rigid analytic varieties. So I want to functor in this way with the property that, first of all, they have the same points. So points here are the set of closed points here. Every Zariski open it stays open, it stays analytically open, and every algebraic function is analytic. But of course, there are many more opens and uh, analytic functions on the other side. Okay, how do we construct such a, a category? Well, just like we make algebraic varieties out of affine schemes. Here the building blocks are affinoids, affinoid spaces. Now the easiest example is uh, the closed unit uh, ball disk, so B1, which is the set of all points such that the periodic norm of x is less than or equal to 1. Um, so periodic norm is 1 over p to the periodic valuation. And here, well, you have to consider this up to the action of Galva group of qp bar over qp. All right, so that's my b1. You can draw it. Like that, and of course, uh, now you want to talk about the analytic functions on it, and you want to replace uh, polynomials with power series. So, it's going to be the set of all power series. But you want you want this to uh, converge on the disk, which amounts to saying that the periodic norm of the coefficient goes to zero and then goes to infinity. So that's um, that's the ring of, uh, ring of analytic functions on the closed unit disk. Now, the thing that I'm not telling you is in fact the most uh, subtle ingredient here. What's happening is that in fact there is a sheaf on B1 such that the global sections are what I've written here. And um, th so the only subtlety there really is, which is different from there, is that you cannot consider the periodic uh, topology because it's too, uh, or too many opens. Yeah? So you just have to consider a growth index topology, which gives you 
instead of all possible coverings, a certain admissible coverings, and so on. So, I mean, if you know the stuff, then you know it. If you haven't seen it, then uh, I would suggest uh, start by looking at uh, Peter Schneider's very short and well-written introduction, Basic Notions in Rigid Geometry. And then you can move from there to, uh, to the standard textbooks. Okay, so, but anyway, I'm just, you know, I'm giving you at least the global sections. And then you can consider BN, which is product of B1 with itself. And, and you can consider the, you know, you can define that similarly. All power series where the coefficients, again, in, in variables where the coefficients go to zero, as in um, the size goes to infinity. Okay. Now, what do I want to do with that? I want to give you what is a general affinity. So an affinoid is given by the vanishing of finitely many analytic functions on one of these BNs. And the FIs are analytic. FIs belong to O analytic of BN. Okay, so that's a general affinoid. Well, you can guess how to define the analytic functions on that. Just take that and divide by the ideal generated by F1, FR, et cetera. Okay, so that's what affinoids are. Those are our building blocks. And let me give you one example before really moving on. This is an example that I want to use. Okay, example, the closed annulus. So, so the condition here is going to be the periodic norm is between, it's less than 1, but bigger than 1 over p. All right, so that's, that's a closed annulus. And why is this an affinoid? Because you can, if I call this A, because I can write A inside B2 as V of x, y minus p. X and Y are the parameters here. Okay. And finally, if you want to construct this functor, uh, maybe I need to say something here that I'm going to use. Yes. So it's a very easy exercise to show that if R is a, pow is a rational power of P, then if, and if you have an affinoid B, and if you have a function, analytic function on B, then the subset given by the norm F bigger than or equal to norm R or less than or equal to norm R is again inside. It's again an affinoid. So I will use that, but it's, you prove it just like what I wrote here. And finally, if you want to do a construction like I explained on this board, which is analytification of algebraic varieties, you need this uh, category of rigid analytic varieties, and you know how to define it. Yeah. So definition. So a rigid analytic variety is a locally ring space, which is locally affinity. In particular, there are two types of affinates that I will, sorry, two types of rigid analytic varieties that I would consider later, which is open disk of radius one and open annulus. And the way you, you show that is just, this is a, a, a union of this closed disk of a smaller radius. And similarly here. Okay, so now let's go back to the construction of periodic modular forms. I was explaining uh, about this reduction map. Sorry, what do I have? I have a reduction map from a set of points of XQP, a set of points of XFP. 
But this is the same as the set of points of XQP analytic. And because the super singular, well, what, what do I want to consider? I want to consider XQP minus reduction inverse of super singular points. And because super singular points are given by the vanishing of the Hasse invariant, it's um, immediate. that um, the set I've written over there can be described as the set of points uh, such that So to say that the reduction is non-zero, to say that the norm of a lift, so by this tilde I mean just any lift. So the norm of a lift is at least one. Of course, you cannot necessarily, you don't necessarily lift H till H, but you, you can do this locally, and so I'm not, I'm not writing it really correctly, but you have to do it locally. All right, so this is given this way, but of course, from the exercise that I wrote over there, this is in fact an this is a rigid analog. In fact, this is an affinite. Well, the set of points of an affinoid inside XQP analytic. And I'm going to call it the ordinary locus, naturally, yeah? XQP ord, or, or the um, uh, ordinary reduction locus. All right, so that's going to be, of course, a rigid analytic variety inside our the analytification of our modular. All right, now that's very nice. <coughs> well, there's also a way in the functor that I explained, there's also a way to take a sheaf and analyti analytify it. So I'm going to just use the same omega here. So omega still lives here. And I'm, I can now define periodic modular forms for you. Okay, so define. M sub K periodic to be a section of this omega K on the ordinary locus. Yep. Thank you. Exactly. This is the same as H R bar, H of R bar being non-zero. Thanks. Um, what else can I say here? Well, there are two expansions at infinity because mm, the Tate curve is ordinary. Okay, so I could define Q expansions. And what I want to do is uh, I want to Um, define uh, Hecke operators acting on them. Right. Now, first of all, this is an enlargement of the space of classical form. Yeah. So, Mk of gamma 1n sits in, inside Mk periodic. Because these are global sections and you can restrict them to, to the smaller open. I'm, I'm going to need to draw a picture before giving you the definition of Hecke operators. So if this is our x1 n, this is our x, and if you look at, well, XQP, if you look at the analytification and visualize it like this, then there's a reduction map, and then there are the super singular points, and then there are everything that reduces to those. There are going to be as many, well, 
well, a priori, you're just going to have look at the reduction inverse of that. But uh, one can show that, in fact, the for every super singular point here, the reduction inverse is an open disk. And it, it essentially comes from the fact that on a smooth variety, the completion of the local ring at, well, or the completion of the local ring at every smooth point is a power series ring. So that's essentially the same thing. All right, so you're going to have a bunch of open disks, which are all the super singular reduction, and the rest is the ordinary reduction locus. And, I'm, and that's the, the hashed space is the X, uh, QP org. Okay. I'm going to go back to this picture, so I'm keep it here. Keep it here, and uh, now I can give you uh, I can explain to you about uh, the heck operator. Now, to define the Hecke operators away from P is immediate because if L is a prime different from P, you look at TL or UL, the correspondence, what does it do? It, it divides your elliptic curve by subgroups of order L, and that takes ordinary uh, elliptic curves to ordinary elliptic curves. So this preserves the XQP. It preserves XQP. So that naturally gives you uh, action on the space of chaotic models. However, for UP, we have a, s a slight problem to begin with because UP does not naturally live on level gamma 1n. So there is no correspondence globally defined. So if I want to make it, I have to give you a partial correspondence defined on some part of this space. So, and for that, you have to use the theory of canonical subgroups. I'll give you uh, quickly what you need. So canonical subgroups. Now, take an, uh, take an ellipse. Um, Ordinary uh, reduction elliptic curve. So E, um, ordinary reduction. And then you look at the formal group of E, and you look at the P torsion in that. Because of the ordinary condition, it's going to give you a subgroup of order P. That's a distinguished subgroup of order P inside the P torsion. And um, in fact, it's a lift of the kernel of Frobenius from characteristic 0 modulo P, characteristic P modulo P. OK. So let me call this H the canonical subgroup. and. What does it tell you? It tells you the following, that if you look at this y and the natural map going in this direction, which sends E, H, P, I'm sorry, I think I was writing it like E, P, H, going to E, P, forgetting H, then if you think about everything analytically, so I put A, N here and here, and you look at the ord subspace here, there's a, there's a section to this map defined on this, which sends EP to the EP and canonical subgroup. So let me call it S, the canonical section. Okay, how, am I, how am I going to use this to define the UP operator? As follows, define UP from XQP ORD to XQP ORD. Follows and send E uh, P 
goes to the sum of all E mod C and P bar, so the quotient of this with all possible C's, which are different from the canonical sum. Okay, so order P are different from the canonical sum. And uh, well, this is, this is a correspondence because again, these are all ordinary and so on. Now you might ask why, why would one think of doing that? The answer is that you want to, uh, your periodic forms are enlargement of your classical forms and you have Q expansion. So you want the UP operator to have the same effect on Q expansion as a classical one. And if you do this calculation at the cusp, you will see you have to remove the subgroup that corresponds to the uh, root subunit, the pit root subunit. So essentially you want to take that and extend it over the uh, ordinary locus and that's a canonical subgroup. It's a bit unnatural to go about it this way and I'm going to explain, in fact, that's not the, really the right way to define it. But I think it's important to first present this and then move on to the better definition. I have I have about 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I can take this final 10 minutes and then talk about overconvergence. All right, now we have, we have defined the space of periodic modular forms uh, and it has its uses, but it's a huge uh, space and sometimes it's really uh, difficult to control it. Uh, especially if, if you are interested in the spectral theory of like Heckel operators, which is very natural to be. You, you want to study, for example, systems of Heckel eigenvalues on these uh, new modular forms. So what, what can we do about that? So it was Dork who observed that. If you look at the UP operator and restrict it to the space of periodic modular forms. Okay, so look at that picture now. Uh, periodic modular forms are defined outside these disks, these super singular disks. If you look at the ones that, ex that extend slightly into the disk, uh, then you, you cut down um, on the size of the periodic modular forms. And the UP operator is in fact compact on the newer space. So it's compact on the space of periodic forms which extend slightly into the super singular disks. And that, that's a great help, of course, in the study of uh, the spectral theory of UP. Uh, you can write down characteristic power series and you can represent uh, the eigenvalues of UP as essentially as zeros of that, inversely zeros of that. Okay, so let me just uh, explain what I mean by slightly, make it more precise. So. So let's, me make, let's make a definition. I'm going to define a, well, first of all, V is going to be um, so I'm going to truncate the usual periodic valuation at one and call it V. And then I define another V going from the points on the modular care to the rational points between zero and one. And this is defined like this. If you have a point here, how do we define it? If R if, if you are in the good reduction case, so R corresponds to some EP of good reduction, then I define uh, V of R to be the, the truncated valuation of this. You take, first reduce E mod P, apply the Hasse invariant to it, and then lift the whole thing arbitrarily 
and take the truncated valuation of that. And there is a, this is a well-defined up to a unit and up to addition by P. And that's that uh, well-defined overall. So that's, uh, what's the idea behind that? The idea behind that is that if this valuation is zero, it exactly means that your R is ordinary. But if it's not, if it's positive, then you have a slight overconvergence, a slight uh, super singularity, sorry. Okay, and otherwise, if you don't have good reduction, just set the valuation to be zero because you're gonna be in the ordinary locus anyway. And if I is an interval inside 0, 1, intersection Q, then define XQP analytic I to be the V inverse of I. So all points whose V lies in that interval. For example, if, um, if I look at The interval zero v, where v is positive, or, or you know, bigger than or equal to zero, then um, <coughs> what we get is the set of all points r such that norm of a lift of the Hasse invariant is bigger than or equal to one over p the v. Okay. So that's just uh, from the definition. So again, you will see that this is again. Uh, an affinoid. Uh, well, V has to be, if V is in P to the power Q, then you get an affinoid. In general, uh, if this I could be, I mean, an open interval, you're gonna get a rigid analytic variety. So you have all these analytic subdomains inside the modular curve. Right. So for example, if I write XQP analytic of zero, zero, that's simply the ordinary locus. And if I write SQP analytic of zero V, well, it's going to be a, a slight enlargement of that. And that's what I mean by a slightly over there for V positive. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, I'm slightly running short in time. So let me, let me try and explain this uh, first. So what does it mean here? So in fact, you could think of the Hasse invariant or the lift of the Hasse invariant as parameters on this disk, on these disks, yeah? And then, so what, what, what it's telling you is that for V, you are going to radius V here, so one over P to the power V, and you're, you're asking that your form extends this much into those super singular disks. Right, so it's natural to define overconvergent forms now as I will do. Okay, so definition. Overconvergent forms is the union or all positive V of uh, the sections uh, over XQP analytic of zero V of omega K. All right, so all sections that, ex that, that extend slightly into the disks, meaning that they're defined over from valuation zero to valuation positive V, okay? Um, Do I have two minutes left? I, I think I could finish it if, I give, if you give me two minutes. Yeah, great. Right, the last thing I want to say is the Heike operators. Um, so again, if L is different from P, then it's fine because the valuations don't change and you divide by the subgroup. But if L equals P, 
Well, how would you define it? You'll have to take the same definition and extend it, which means that you'll have to extend canonical subgroups from the ordinary locus to slightly into the over, uh, over to the super singular locus. So, so extend canonical subgroups. Well, maybe maybe I should say canonical subgroups over converge. And, uh, and you'll just use the same formula. I'm not going to write it down. So that's, and of course, again, the effect on the Q expansion is the same as you, you know from classical forms. Um, okay, there, there is a result that I think actually fits better with the beginning of the next talk. So I'll, I'll stop here.